Welcome to episode 199 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network and sponsor betonline.ag. Hit that subscription button to be first to listen to the hottest takes on the biggest stories coming out of the camp new. I'm Dan Hilton, and I am again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, Barca Blog, and many others. Frances, I guess I can add featured by FC Barcelona on the supporters page to that list. Hola, Gules. Yeah, apparently you can. Um... You know, it, it probably is a big deal for a lot of people. Um, I just thought it was fun. Um, I got contacted by the FC Barcelona Facebook page. And, um, yeah, they wanted to do a feature and, uh, you know, talking about what life has been for me as a Barca supporter. Um, it was an opportunity for me to sort of go back to my very beginnings when I started playing football, first time on the Camp Nou, etc. And, yeah, it was, it was good to share. If you want to check it out, it's up in barcablog.com. Right, and there's a ton more at barcablog.com, so get lost there once you start learning about Frances. You can look at all the different stuff we have up there. And I want to, just before we get started today on the show, give a little rundown. We're going to be talking about, unfortunately, some of the things going on with Sevilla and the aftermath of that, not really breaking down the match so much. We have, there's a YouTube video on it, there's articles on it, there is tons of content that we made breaking down tactically and player grades, all that about Sevilla, but we're going to be talking about the big idea of what it feels like that Barca is kind of letting the league slip away. We're going to talk a little bit about PK's comments and Real Madrid and VAR, sure. But then later on the show, I'm excited that we are had the opportunity to speak to a professional football player with connections to FC Barcelona. Obviously, if you clicked on this podcast, you know that it is John Piquero, the son of Jose Maria Piquero. So I'm excited to hear from him. But for now, Frances, I want to start even before we begin with La Gran Pregunta and mention that the Premier League has been back as well. And they have, if you notice the back of their jerseys, they've been putting Black Lives Matter in place of their names on the back of the jerseys above their numbers. And my only point that I want to make here at the start of the show is La Liga, you got to start to do better. There's something going on, and the Premier League decided to immediately understand and realize that whether it was the interviews, pregame or postgame, as well as, again, on the field as well, there are ways, there's a, there's a right way to go about this. There's a right way to show support, and so La Liga, just step it up, do a little bit better. Premier League is uh, being the example which is maybe, you know, if you want the Liga to be called just as good or deserving to be just as marketable as a Premier League, then you just need to do better. And I think that's, that's, I think that's the point there. Frances, it's going to be a bumpy transition here, but uh, speaking of players doing better, I think that kind of leads us right into La Gran Pagunta that you, know, you and I both agree that FC Barcelona's players need to do a little bit better. And so our question that we're asking, oh, this is a silly question, Frances. I'm going to actually put the blame on you. You came up with the question, is Kike Setien turning into Ernesto Valverde? And I just want to let all our listeners know, I asked him not to have to talk about Ernesto Valverde again, but alas, Frances, we're asking, why is this happening? Well, it is happening because it looks like the players in the dressing room have far too much power than they should. Um, if we look back at Ernesto Valverde's latest months and even probably the last year even, he didn't quite handle the, the dressing room. Um, you've got very powerful players, obviously Messi and Suarez, but you've got others such as Alba, Busquets, Piquet, etc., uh, that seem to have far too much influence um, if we want to have a winning team. The fact that Rakitic is playing that much, the fact that Vidal is playing that much, the fact that Busquets is playing pretty much every single minute, it is um, it's a little bit excessive. And, um, you know, what Barca need at this moment in time is, is something to change and someone to come and, 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 and basically make an impact that the players that we've got, they're currently not, not doing. Um, in the last game, it was a very clear example. Um, before the game even started, so in the previous press conference, Kike Setien very clearly explained that Luis Suarez was not ready to play 90 minutes. Then the match starts, the match goes on, 70, 80, 90 minutes, and, and Luis Suarez is still playing. When you've got Ansu Fati, who arguably was our best player in the previous game, he was um, he got the four stars of the Barca Vlog review um, for that match. And unfortunately, he doesn't feature at all. Um, this was a game, and you know, you're allowed five substitutions. So this was a game that um, needed speed, that needed something different. And unfortunately, with Dembele out, with the young injured, and basically, a lot of players just being Messi dependent, e.g., whenever something gets tricky, they just pass the ball back to Messi rather than 
them finding solutions themselves, then I think Setien was was silly not to include Fatih. And rather than just stupidity, it, it, you need to think that there's more. There's there's um, you know if I'm going to play Fatih now, I may upset someone. The hierarchy of the team may impact on my. This is Setien obviously thinking it may impact in my long term status at the club. I, I don't quite know. It seems for me. The players are far too powerful and uh, we need a manager that can, you know, put the ground and basically lead the way. Yeah, I agree with you on all those different points in terms of the the power of the players, but I'm not even pushing back or disagreeing with you. I think I'm just thinking of it and seeing it in a different way. And the different way I'm seeing it is that the players that are on the team right now, and I spoke about this a few weeks ago, as much as I would love to see Ricky Poot, for anyone that follows the YouTube channel or obviously you've listened to this pod for years now, you know that I'm all about making sure we get less listeners and downloads so that we talk about La Masia. That is what I tend to do. That is what happens. So I've been talking about Ricky Pooj, and I've been on the Ansu Fadi. I'm going to pat myself on the back. I've been on the Ansu Fadi train since he was 15, which is too young for a professional footballer. But that meant that I knew about him two years before he showed up on the first team. And I knew that kid was special. And yet here he is still on the bench, but he's 17. And what I've been saying too is that we didn't expect as much as we're saying and we're saying something needs to change and we're crying out for, you know, Ricky Poos needs to start. I mean, I don't know how many people I saw say tweet or put on Facebook, Ricky Poos needs to start. But we know realistically, we have to understand fundamentally that it's not his time, that he's not going to start in this kind of situation. And I want to explain, and not even in defense of Kiki Setien, but the explanation is that FC Barcelona have the players they have, okay? So I don't really think that is Kiki Setien's fault, who came in in January and certainly had zero to do with any transfers. Uh, Potentially, maybe he just said, okay, sure, bring in Brothwaite as an extra sub after he had signed on, that being Kiki Setien with the club. But all that said, like tactically against Sevilla, uh, and, I, and I called this out in the YouTube video, that he was doing everything he could, being Kike Setien, not to get caught out on the counter. So without Frankie de Young, who's missing a month, that is actually a bigger difference in deciding the La Liga title than any other factor. Not having Frankie de Young, because not only of how young he is and how he can actually, in theory, have gone 90 minutes over and over again, but the things that he adds with switching the ball and just a little bit more of a quickness of progressive play uh, is going to be sorely lacking and sorely missing when you have a combination of Rakitic, Vidal, Busquets, and Arter, in theory, as well. And then Puj, who seems to be that fifth uh, midfielder coming off the bench. But as I said, Puj isn't going to start because... As much as we love what he does offensively, and he adds that thing offensively, where Kike Setien got his tactics right was defensively. Because Rakitic, I know he was poor. He was. He was poor. He was not doing what he needed to do offensively, or he was not adding anything. He was not being direct with his ball playing. But in the first 35 minutes, he was. And they were trying to use the right wing, that being Kike Setien with Nelson Semedo, because that is where Sevilla was giving them. They were giving them the space. Regulon was coming forward, so Nelson Semedo was getting in behind. That was all working. And Jordi Alba was staying at home. And he, I, I thought Jordi Alba may have been my man of the match, if not for Jules Conde. Ter Stegen was great too. But Jordi Alba had, one, I think, one of his best performances I've seen in months and months and months. It was just he was defensively sound. He did not make any errors. His spacing was perfect. And he also came forward at times. But they kept him home so that he would just do the defensive job on Jesus Navas and not let him come forward. That's usually what Sevilla likes to do. They like to at- attack down the, the the right flank. And that meant that Rakitic and Vidal and Busquets would all have to win 50-50 balls in the midfield. And they did that for the first 35 minutes of the game. And then they had that cooling break just around the 30th minute or so. And then things started to deteriorate. And going back to your point why I agree is because when you have this aging squad like this, where Barcelona used to, and the way Kiki Setien's style is set to do, he's set to take the air out of teams. And so in the 65th, 75th, 85th minute, that's when Barcelona are supposed to strike. But they can't actually capitalize on what's supposed to be their strategy if all their players are 29 or older. I saw that even Brathway, he's 29, but they had seven other starters that were 30 or older. And so the other team isn't losing their legs. Barca is losing their legs. So it's almost counterproductive to the game plan that you set out. And that means you either have to put in younger players earlier or certainly there needs to be fault shown to Kike Setien for not using his subs. Without a doubt. I think that the fact that you, Ricky Puig was used for five minutes in Sevilla is just nonsensical. Um, when you've got a team opposite that, you know, they would normally be tiring. But then again, they would normally be in front of the home fans, which obviously we can have at this moment in time because of the pandemic. Um, I strongly believe that Ricky Puig would have had a good half an hour, especially in the answer, in the absence of uh, Frankie de Jong. 
I, I just want to jump in on Pooj just real quick for a second here. I think you're right too about the 30 minutes for Pooj. Pooj can't start because if you watch him even in the few minutes he was on the field, he makes defensive mistakes. He's out of positioning. It's just from the third division to the first division, guys are faster and he is not in the right spots yet. And that comes with experience and time. That's you saw with Iniesta in his, the first part of his career. He defensively was not in the right spots and that leaves you exposed. And so Kike Setien really needs, because the rest of his team, particularly Luis Suarez and Messi, they just cannot press, and by the 80th minute, they are completely gassed. So if Puj is not in the right spots, Barcelona are going to be exposed, and instead of blaming him, it's going to be on the back line. So Frances, I completely agree. Offensively, that game was calling out for Ricky Puj, but that's why he can't start, but needs to be a sub off the bench. And there is actually a big distinction there. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, granted, he cannot start against Sevilla because obviously they placed third or fourth in La Liga now. And um, it's a high caliber match. But, you know, when you're playing teams like with respect, Leganes, Eibar, etc., he should have been a starter. And obviously that hasn't happened. Of course, we had a pandemic in the middle. So everything I'm saying is relative. But you need to trust your younger players against the, say, say easier minor teams in La Liga so that they grow and they have confidence when, when you actually need them. Um, I was listening to Catalonia Radio earlier this week, and uh, it was a very interesting dude from Sevilla that was talking. He was one of the fans. He said that Setien coached Betis as if he was Barca when he was at Betis, and now he's coaching Barca as if he was Betis. He's, he's right. He's right. Um, he went for a 4-4-2 in defense. Um, normally, it's a 4-3-3, but obviously opting for Braithwaite and giving him you know, so heavy defensive duties to fulfill he was effectively the fourth midfielder. He reinforced that when he introduced Arthur in the second half. Um, and then the whole scheme was changing. Then he changed it again. He inputted Griezmann and Griezmann again was, was uneventful. It had very little purpose. So yeah, it was a little bit of a shambles. Um, the midfield from Barca had very low purpose, very low impact and a slow execution. And like that, we're not gonna win La Liga um, as I'm sure that Pique um, spoke about after the game, right? Yeah, he did speak about that after the game, and we're going to speak about that after the ad break. So it seems like the prevailing notion is that Barcelona have let La Liga slip because they've dropped points to Sevilla while Real Madrid are really playing well and they have VAR going their way. And Piquet's comments kind of said, people might say it's it's mind games, and Piquet always does say this kind of thing, like the league favors the league, Real Madrid and that it's Real Madrid's trophy to lose now. And I think there is definitely truth to it, not that even that the referees are Real Madrid fans or that they're getting help. I think regardless of that, that you're seeing the argument amongst kool that Barcelona needs to do better and they need to just take care of business. If they had won every match, then it wouldn't matter how much the officials were trying to help Real Madrid or if VAR things go their way. It would just it would just be a success for Barcelona. But instead, I think we talked about mentality, and it's not fair for me to sit here in a basement in, in New York to say what's going on in the mind of Alba and PK and Rakitic and Busquets. I, I think there are times when we have our agendas, and I think you even see that we're at a point where our squad has been around so long that people have their camps. And I think one of the fashionable things after this match, as I, I, I said to you privately, was that people were jumping on Rakitic and saying that he was the worst player in the entire world. But Vidal was just as bad. Vidal added less than Rakitic did in that match. Because at least Vidal showed up for the first 35 minutes. I mean, excuse me, Rakitic showed up for the first 35 minutes. I didn't see anything of Vidal, right? So just you need to make sure that you're giving criticism to all the players and, and seeing each match as its own standalone thing. It's not just that Rakitic is trash, so he can't do a job. But if he does his job, then he deserved to get the start and he should have played. But it, that wasn't necessarily the case for almost anybody against Sevilla as the match went on. And all that said about PK and the feelings about the, the league... The big story today that, again, always makes everybody wonder is it's not confirmed yet, but it seems like where there's smoke, there's fire. And Artur going to Juventus for Pianic seems like it is happening very, very soon. It seems to be on the horizon. And that is simply because a few weeks ago, again, where there's smoke, there's fire, a report was apparently leaked that Barcelona want to add some experience to the squad. They want to add a, particularly a midfielder that's going to add experience and that's going to be able to, I guess, play the ball forward a little bit more. But that, again, isn't really Pjanic's game either. Pjanic is merely the in, a, almost an exact same replica type player as is De Young, but he's seven, eight years older. And so I, again, scratch my head and question what's going on there. And it also makes me worry about this summer. As much as I'm excited about other thing here, I'm almost going through all the news of the week, but Pedri had an assist. 17-year-old Pedri for Las Palmas had an assist that if you have not seen this, I can't even put it in the description because I don't know if it's still on the internet, but just... 
Google it or put it in Twitter and find Pedri's assist. It was awesome. And then all the comments underneath were, wait till he gets to Barca, and he's not allowed to do that anymore. And then I even watched Trincao and his ability and willingness to take a shot for Braga in the Portuguese division. It's going to be a big step up for him too. But if he has the same freedom to be able to take shots from outside the box, then that's going to work out. But if he comes to Barca and is neutered, and if the only people that come to Barca or new players that arrive are ones like Pianic who go, okay, this is what we do at Barca. I just need to fit into exactly, not the Barca way, but I need to just give the ball to Messi and pass it into double teams and triple teams when opponents are on his back, and that's the way we do things here, then that's going to be the kind of players that they're going to bring in. And that is unfortunate because, again, we still have the eye on the 2021 election and seeing what might happen there. And the board, this isn't about whether or not you and I, Frances, want a different board. This is us just saying that if that, that's when the next election is, 2021. There's no vote of no confidence, nothing like that. It's, 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 it's actually the election. And with one eye there, this board is going to continue to make decisions that just to support basically their next 12, 11 to 12 months of their tenure. Wow, Dan, you just threw away all of the points that went through your head in there. And I think that is a great, great reflection of the moment that Barca is going through right now. There, there seems to be a lot of different uh, fires to put up. Um, I'm going to try and go one by one. Uh, the, the words from Piqué, well, you know you know me. And the regular listeners do know that as well. Um, I don't like complaining about referees. Um, I think it's a loser's mentality to talk about what referees mistakes are and saying that, you know, you, you, you get what you deserve at the end of the Liga. Um, La Liga is a very long tournament. And if you're the best team, you normally win it. Um, having said that, it is obvious that some Florentino magic has been worked at some stage. And uh, Madrid seemed to be very lucky with refereeing decisions lately. But that, that's not to, to hide away. It is a factor, but it's not to hide away the fact that Barca have won 22 out of 40 five points away from the Camp Nou in La Liga. Now, you can't win the championship like that. You know, you can whine all you want, you can cry all you want, you can, you know, put VAR riddles on Facebook or whatever. It's not going to change. Um, a, a team that loses more points away from home than they win is not a worthy champion. And Barca have just been too poor until this point. And, you know, for Piquet to go... And right after a very disappointing nil-nil draw, when everyone knew that Barca had to win every single point, it's just it's just disappointing. And to be honest, to be honest, I think it's beneath them. Um, granted, Johan Cruyff, when he was coaching at Barca, he used to play mind games like that. But never in my in my experience, in my memory of, of the time, he came out and said that La Liga is lost. In fact, he always. I remember when we were chasing Deportivo La Coruña. And uh, with the, you know, with the great Arsenio Iglesias leading uh, Deportivo at the time, he just kept putting the pressure, but it was a positive pressure. It's not this sort of losing, whining cantinella, these, uh, these songs that, you know, echoing in, in everyone's ears. And to be honest, um, I don't, obviously, I don't like Real Madrid fans and I don't like what they stand for. But to be honest, I, I do agree with them that, that Piquet's words after the game were shameful. Now, you did go on to mention Pjanic, Pedri, Trincao, etc. And I've got not much more to add. I just hope that, you know, we finish this season in the best possible way and that we can focus on, on great signings this season. And when I say great signings, unfortunately, I'm not including Pjanic on that. But, you know, it seems that the board has got different ideas. Yeah, I mean, that transfer policy makes sense if they're bringing in two younger players in Pedri, who, by the way, I just want to add that he was when he was signed, it was reported that he would go into Barca B next year. But if they don't get promotion, it makes no sense to have Pedri, who's in the second division, doing well as a teenager for Las Palmas this season and put him in the third division for next year with Barca B if they don't get promotion. So that's going to be a big question. And, you know, if that's the case, and I think he deserves a shot at the first team, but what's best for the development of the player? And I think that's really hitting home the point here. What's best for the development of some players is different from what's best for FC Barcelona. And that's why, going all the way back to that point before we get to this interview, we're going to talk about Ansu Fati with John Piquera as well near the end of that interview. And the big question with Ansu Fati continues to be, What's best for the player isn't necessarily what's best for FC Barcelona at the moment, or at least that's what some of the club might believe. So that's why, again, any minute he gets is almost going to be a consolation for the rest of the season. But for the amount of depth they have, and that's my biggest worry, right? I, I think I talked about it last week on the show that you look at Barcelona and you look at their bench and you look at Real Madrid and you look at their bench and there's a big difference. And I think that's what's going to hurt or be the reason why FC Barcelona is not able to get this done. And I think the way they play is important, too, because 
Athletic Club, I think it's a good place to leave it because Athletic Club, if you have the senior years before tomorrow's match, well, then you've understood that Athletic Club is known to, you know, try to punch you in the mouth first and they're going to try to rough Barcelona up a little bit. But as much as I say that, I watched them against Athletic, Atletico Madrid and that was just a... <laughs> It was an ugly match, but tactically very sound. You know, both teams went out there and tried to do their best to shut down passing lanes and to make things difficult for the opponent, and they both did that. And that's I, I think that match was well played tactically, but an ugly match to watch, sure. But then against Real Betis this past week, a team that's a little more open, Athletic Club decided to go at them. And they played with a lot of skill, a lot of technic- technical, tactical intelligence, and they got a result there too. So Athletic Club, I think knowing what Barcelona's weaknesses are, they're just going to be compact. And every team is going to do it, Leganes and Sevilla. Every team is just going to be compact and be willing to try to finally wait until Barca's tired legs get tired, as, as much as an oxymoron. And they're going to wait for them to, to wear down, and they're going to try to break on the counter. And that's what teams are going to continue to do until Barca can show that they have a remedy for that that isn't named you know, Messi, because Sevilla, even on that free kick, they packed eight players, a five-man wall, one behind, and Jules Conte was basically a free safety to head the ball out and over. And there was one other player ready to make that move over if Messi decided to go in the other top corner. So they had eight players. So that meant that Barcelona had a ton of players who were available. And it's not a knock on Messi because he would have scored the goal if not for Jules Conte arriving at the very last second. But again, that goes to the point that Teams know and are figuring out and have been trying to figure out how to stop Messi. So basically, if you can get Messi to not have a piece of magic where he puts the ball in the back of the net, and if teams can contain Messi by you know 60 to 70%, they're willing to deal with whatever his teammates are doing because they just aren't doing enough at the moment. The important part is for Setien to work out what formation he wants, uh, to instill confidence in all of his players that they don't have to look for Messi every single time. Um, I don't necessarily blame Messi for it. Um, you know, he's not going to try and become a lesser player or shy away from responsibility. But, you know, and, and you know, he does get criticized. But someone like Ousmane Dembele, he normally just creates a play for himself. Um, he's not someone who is constantly looking for Messi the same way that Neymar wasn't either. And we just need more players that are independent, that are confident and that are fresh enough to take the initiative. And uh, if we don't have that, then what we need is a manager that doesn't bow down to what the dressing room wants or and needs to change the status quo to make things happen for the benefit of the team. Well, I think what we need to do now is hear from our interview in John Piquero. Again, that is the son of Jose Maria Piquero. So let's head to that interview now. Speaking now with professional soccer player and son of Jose Maria Piquero, captain of Johan Cruyff's dream team, it's John Piquero. How are you holding up in that Arizona heat and quarantine, John? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, not too bad, not too bad. Pretty used to the heat now. I've been here for, for a while now, so... Obviously, with everything that's happening, just uh, concerned and uh, obviously getting ready to, to start back up the season. Well, the first question we want to ask you, as we mentioned, you are in Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States at the moment as a professional soccer player yourself. But in your life, you've lived in Barcelona, Mexico, San Sebastian in the Basque Country. You've lived in Valencia, Poland, Peru, the United States and Canada. I think I hit all of them. What are some of the challenges to moving around so much as a player and even as a child? Well, I think I'm very fortunate. You know, I don't think as a, as a negative, I, I see it as a great opportunity that I had to travel and, and see the world. And, and obviously, uh, football has been my life ever since I grew up and, and uh, since I was born. So I feel very fortunate. Obviously, it's not always easy, you know, moving around uh, new schools, uh, new teams. But obviously, um, I think uh, it helped me a lot. And, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very glad to be where I am. Well, we're going to be talking a lot about your family today. So I think before we bounce around too much of your childhood and your adult life as a professional or your dad's career, I want you to tell us the story of the first tattoo that you got when you were 16 years old. Yeah. So, so that tattoo, um, like when we were in Peru and, uh, my, both my parents turned 40, uh, when we were there. So, um, it was kind of, no, they turned 50. Um, they were like, we want to do something special. And my, neither of my parents had any tattoos. And, and they, 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 we had this logo, family logo, that was done for their wedding. And we decided we were all going to get it. So time went back and, and we went back to Spain. And one day my sister shows up with that tattoo. And then my dad was like, kind of like, oh, my God, now I have to do it. So my dad, my dad and I went, we got it. And then like when we did that, my mom was like, oh my God, I need to do it too. So now the, the four of us have the same tattoo. Uh, it's my parents' initials. 
That's pretty awesome. I think I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to take your lead and start doing some tattooing in my house as well. Um, what was it like growing up in a family that basically you're surrounded by professional footballers? Um, did you feel any pressure growing up, or was it a blessing? I think it's definitely a blessing. You know, uh, I'm so passionate about the game, and and I think uh, I'm very fortunate to to have traveled the world and seen so many games and and so many players. There was always like that in my mind. You know, people were asking me like, "Are you going to be as good as your dad?" or or, or what's like do you play do you play football um so so I mean that was always there but in my head I was always like I'm not gonna be as good as my dad so <laughs> let's forget that and I just want to be the best player that that I can be um and and then there was like a long time that I didn't really enjoy playing I, I kind of liked watching it more I just didn't like I I was scared of playing I was scared of people giving me the ball uh it was not a good time but then I think that came with with a lot of travel a lot of changing te teams like I never was able to settle and develop as a player. But then once I, I was 16 and, and I knew I was going to be in, in a place for a while, it, it helped me uh, find myself a little more and, and enjoy the game a little more. Well, yeah, at the age of 16, I guess, is that where you decide that you want to not only look at eventually being a professional, but obviously at 17 is when you jump over to Wake Forest, play and start your collegiate career in the United States. And as much as you say that maybe your heart hadn't been in it at a time, you do wind up winning the Mac Herman Trophy for the top collegiate player in the U.S., so not too, not too shabby there. Different from training, though, and the way you had always played the game elsewhere when you moved to the U.S.? Well, the opportunity to come to the U.S. was more like um, I wanted to continue studying and playing. Um, I knew that if I stayed in Spain, it was going to be hard to play football uh, and choose like a school that was like good. So it was kind of like if I stay in Spain, I'm probably going to like have to quit fo like playing football at a, at a good level and just focus in school. So uh, coming here was more like I want to try it out. I didn't really know what uh, college soccer was. So I was lucky enough to end up at a place like Wake. And it was very different, you know, I was 17, there was guys in my teams that were 21, 22, uh, very physical game. I was lucky enough to, to come to a coach that loved the European style, loved Barcelona, loved, loved football. So uh, trainings were good and, and just took me some time to adapt and, and learn the, the, the game here. Well, that's, that's pretty awesome. Obviously, now working at Phoenix, uh, making a difference in there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, where do you see yourself in five years' time? It's hard to say. Uh, I honestly try to take it. I'm not going to say month to month, but, but obviously season to season, you know, you try, uh, I'm still pretty young. I'm still 23. So I, I know I have a lot of things that I, I can work on and things to improve. So yeah, I'm just saying it year to year. This year has been a little weird, obviously with, with everything that's happening. Um, but yeah, once the season starts, it's, it's our time to, to play again, to shine and uh, continue to get better. And, and, and obviously I think if you do well, then obviously you're rewarded with more opportunities and, and that's what, what I'm hoping to do. Yeah, you're currently with the Phoenix Rising FC in the USL Championship, the second tier of American soccer. And I would also argue as well, Phoenix, arguably the most successful side in the regular season over the last few seasons in the USL. But as far as where you started your professional career in the U.S., you were drafted by the Chicago Fire, fifth overall in 2018, also took a stop in Toronto. What did you learn from those professional experiences at the top level in the MLS and being drafted so high? It was a great experience, you know, obviously the, the opportunity to play in the MLS. Uh, I came as a 17 year old and uh, I would have never uh, believed that if you told me then that I was going to be able to play in the MLS and get drafted. Uh, not fifth, but just in general, get drafted was, was one of my, my goals. So, yeah, obviously things happen and, and uh, the great experiences that now looking back are amazing. You know, the, the players that I've shared locker room with, the stadiums that I've played, all the memories are there and, and obviously Things could have gone better. Um, I wish that I was still there, but obviously things happen for a reason and, and you got to learn from, from your experiences and uh, try to, as I said, get better and, and, and keep improving. For sure. Talk, talking about learning and experiences, um, there's someone in your household, or at least when you were growing up, your dad, who obviously Jose Maria Vaquero, Barca captain, absolute legend. Would you say he was the most influential person growing up in terms of um, adapting to your footballing style? Or are you a sort of combination and mix of all the advice that you've always got? So funny enough, my dad never wanted me to play. Um, when I was really young, uh, obviously, all I saw was my dad on TV and people like asking for autographs. And I wanted to be like him. You know, I, I wore my Barcelona jersey to, to school every day. Uh, my mm -hmm. mom wouldn't let me wear it anymore. She, she, she was pissed at me all the time. Um, but yeah, he, he didn't want me to play because people would think that 
I was playing because of him. And my mom was actually the one who started like putting me, taking me to training. And uh, for, for the longest time, my dad never came to games and he would support me. And like, he would ask how things went, but like, he would never really give me any advice or coach me or anything like that. It was not until I probably came to the States and uh, things starting to like go a little, not better, but just more serious. And uh, that's when he, he, he watched a lot of games and we talked more football. We always talked football. We always watched games together. And when he was a coach, we would talk and all that stuff was there. But about my game, it was not probably until I was in, in, in college. Now he watches, he stays up every day, every game until 4 a.m., watches the game live. And uh, we talk a lot of football, what things that I can improve, things that I can do. Um, but more as a friend than as a coach, I would say. Well, I want to go back to originally your learning as well. You were born in the city of Barcelona in, in Sitges. And what would you say playing for that academy, what that was like playing against Barca's academy, but as well as just give an explanation to people about what it's like to still be in the city of Barcelona, but not necessarily be in either Espanol or Barcelona's academies, but being into one of those other places where the football just, it, it seems to all be one big idea, but you're not necessarily in that academy. Yeah, I mean... I, I was born in Barcelona, moved to Mexico until I was three. And then when I got back, that's when I probably started playing when I was five or six. I was a goalkeeper until I was like nine. Um, but yeah, I mean, in Spain, it's not like here in like a big city, there's one or two academies. I live in a 30,000 people town and there's two teams, two, two academies uh, for such a small town. It's crazy, but obviously all the, every kid plays, plays football. So, so it was good. You know, I, I was never one of the best players. Uh, I was just, good I always played but but never never was one of, of the big stars so so with that and then uh when I started I moved to San Sebastian and then I played there for for two years and I moved to Valencia played there for, for one year and then came back to Barcelona played for another academy then ended up going to Poland it was just a lot of changes you know uh there's so many good teams and so many good players in Europe in general uh but but obviously in, in Spain in the Barcelona area there's so many divisions you know you think about the u12s and there's six divisions and in the four divisions there's four groups in the fifth divisions there's eight groups uh it's just so hard to explain here because people don't understand how many kids are, there are and how many kids play football there exactly um also you are really well traveled you lived in many different countries and having that experience from playing football in barcelona or in the barcelona area which i did as well um, obviously wouldn't translate to everyone watching this, but would you, would you say that living in so many different countries has influenced how you see the game? Um, and what would you say to people who think that the Barca way is the right way to play football? Yeah, I, I definitely think that I'm lucky enough to, to have traveled and, and played with, in different countries. You know, when, when my dad was training in, in, in Peru, um, I was there with their second team. When, when I was living in Poland, I was playing with, with the U19s when I was only a U15 uh, of that team, just a lot of experiences and, and things that at the end of the day, you just like take in, you know, and without even realizing when people say the, the Barca way is the right way. It's, I don't think it is. I think it's what I believe in though, but I think it's very subjective. You know, I think if you told Mourinho that he would probably tell you that that's not the right way because at the end of the day, winning takes different things for different people and, and, and uh, different players. And, uh, but I definitely believe that Barca plays a way that inspires me and that I think is very beautiful. And I think if I ever coached, I would definitely want to play in a similar way because at the end of the day, Barca is only one and they, they're so good because they do the, the things in a certain way, but they're on, the only ones who can do it. No one can imitate what they do. We want to continue on that idea. What is your connection still today, we'll say, to Barcelona just as a fan, but as far as watching how much of it or what you see or any connections you might have to people from the past in Barcelona? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, my dad uh, played. Now he, he still works. He's the head of the, of the second team uh, for, for Barcelona. So, I mean... I've met a lot of my dad's ex-teammates. Um, I've grown up going to Camp Nou, going every weekend. When I'm back now, I go to watch trainings. To I still go to every game that I can. Here in the U.S., I watch every game. That's sacred. Uh, when Barca plays, forget about me. I'm, I'm watching it. I'm just a fan, you know. I, I love watching football, but especially love watching Barca. Um, just the way they play and the idea of, 
seeing Messi, I think every time you, you miss him, it's just one less time you're going to see him. And, 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 and once he's gone, he's never going to be there, you know? So honestly, one of the things that I always say that obviously other than family and, and friends that I miss the most is, is being able to, to go to the stadium and, and watch Barca play. I've got the same feeling. Um, I moved to London around 18 years ago and I live in Qatar now, so I certainly understand, I understand how you feel. You mentioned Messi, obviously it's the easy name to mention, but out of all the years you've watched Barca and all the players you've met, etc., other than Messi, who is the most impressive player that you've seen play at the Camp Nou? Uh, for me, it was growing up. I mean, I always say Messi. I'm not going to say Messi is my favorite player because I don't think he's from this world. Uh, I don't think uh, <laughs> it's just other than him. Uh, Iniesta, for me, was very inspiring. I grew up watching him. I think I started going to the stadium when he started playing and just his ability, his presence. I've, I've been able to meet him a couple times every time I've met him. Um, conversations with him were, were great, you know, and uh, he's just someone that I – look up to and, and think of, of so highly. And I think he, other than Messi, was the, he's been the best player to, to ever play at Barca. Yeah, as far as, again, mentioning your dad and speaking to some of these legends, you've said before that your dad, the advice that he seems to have given you the most was to take things day by day. What other advice have you been given by whether it was your two uncles or your aunt or all the different legends that you've spoken to that sticks with you and seems to come up training to training? Yeah, uh, something that my dad always says is like, every day is a new opportunity. And honestly, that's how I try to see life, everything, you know, there's always bads and goods. And I think that's, if you ask me one thing that I take from my dad, it's probably that, Um, you know, like sometimes when you're, when you're a football player, you, you want to think forward, you know, and you want to think about tomorrow, whatever it is. And, and I think it's like everything in life. Uh, There's so much you can do, control what you can control and enjoy it. You know, I've, I'm so fortunate to do what, what I do uh, to play football for a living. And um, I got to enjoy it. You know, I think uh, like everything, uh, if you don't enjoy it, you're going to look back and, and regret it. Well, talking about enjoying then, um, it looks like Barca have obviously restarted after the, this horrendous pandemic that we have experienced, um, giving us fans and millions of supporters around the world actually something to look forward to, like, like you are saying. Um, how do you see Barca at the moment and what's your prediction for the rest of the season? It's hard to say, you know, also we haven't played probably the best two teams in the league. We've played two teams that um, are, are in the bottom. Uh, so I think it'll, this, this Friday will, will give us a good idea of, of where we stand playing a team like Sevilla who, who come back strong. And, but I think obviously uh, Messi looks recharged and I think uh, he's a martyr on the team and, and he's the guy who brings the energy, but Obviously, we have, I think, squad-wise, the best team in the league. And also with the Champions League, for example, I think being one game, it can be beneficial for us. Uh, you know, like any game, I'll, I'll take uh, us before anyone, you know. Um, so so I, I think we're going to win the league. That's that's just what I hope. And um, I have good good positive energy for, for the Champions League, too. It's just when you're talking, you're referring to us as us. That, that is very telling. It's good to see. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry. I, I don't even think oh, about it. Awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, John, I, I want to continue to get your thoughts on FC Barcelona. Again, you have such a pulse on what seems to be happening even still all the way in Phoenix. And I want to ask you, you spoke earlier about being in some of those Catalan academies and just how cutthroat football can be for youngsters in the city of Barcelona. So why do you think that we're seeing so few Barca academy graduates making it as Barca starters in the last five, six, seven years? I, th- I think it's very tough. Um, I, w- I was lucky enough to, four years ago, I think, uh, to do the preseason with Barca B, their second team. And from those guys, um, I think only Alenia, um has made it to the, to the first team. And even then, he, he has to go somewhere else for opportunities sometimes. And, and that's how it is in, in, in football. Last year, I was in Toronto, but I, I needed to play. And as a young player, you, you need to look for for other options. Are these players good enough to play in La Liga? Absolutely. Uh, there's all these guys that I played with are playing in first division now, but playing for Barca is not the same thing, you know, and, and I think it's tough. I think it's tough to, to get there and, and to beat the guys who they buy for a lot of money, uh, who have already proved that they can compete not only La Liga, but at the Champions League level. So, so I think it just takes time, you know, and, and uh, like now with, with this so many good players, you know, like Araujo played amazing the other day. Uh, Ricky Puch came in. Uh, Collado's played this year too. There's, there's more young players coming up and 
uh, there's always going to be good good young players, but also it comes to opportunity. And, and I was thinking about it too. Now with COVID, obviously there's going to be more rotations. There's going to be more opportunities for for young players. So maybe they take them and, and they can stay there for next year. Yep, for sure. Uh, one last question from me. Uh, there's one of the players that you didn't mention, which is the one that made the jump straight from the under 16s all the way to the first team. That's Ansu Fati. Um, there has been rumors, you know, popping up in sport mainly, and then obviously broadcasted by the Times, etc., around the world. Um, is Ansu Fati now? Do you see? How, how do you feel about having a progression that has been so quick from the youngsters, and do you see him staying there for the long term? Yeah, I mean, Ansu Fati is something different. You know, he didn't even do preseason with the first team, and and he ends up. Uh, I think he has five goals in the year, which I think is for a 17 year old is, is not bad. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, it, things happen like that. You know, he played his first game, scored a goal and, and that's already like in, in everyone's mind. Uh, obviously he's very talented, but you know, um, he's competing. He's competing with, with Dembele when he comes back, he's competing with Griezmann, Suarez to play. So that's the thing, you know, in a, in a team, he would start in every other team, but in Barca, there's so much competition, but it's the same competition for, for, for everyone. So, so obviously I think Barcelona uh, really like him and I think Barcelona value him. And, and I definitely think he's going to be an important piece for the club moving forward. Well, John, before we let you go, I'm going to ask you one more. I want from both your career and your father's career, what he has spoken about. Now, maybe the Champions League winning that was his highlight of his career, but I'd like to hear what your dad has said is one of his proudest moments as a player. And I also want to hear your proudest or your biggest highlight that you find at this point still in your early career. Yeah, uh, don't don't quote me on this, you know, because uh, this is coming from from me. But I definitely think that his goal against Kaiser Lautern, uh, giving Barcelona the opportunity to continue in the Champions League, um, is his most important moment. Uh, and at FC Barcelona, obviously playing there for nine years, don't quote me on it because I feel like he has a lot of memories and a lot of things that have happened that I probably cannot speak for. But me growing up, for sure, I, I remember everyone talking about it. And, and now you go to the Barcelona Museum and, and they have that, that moment uh, settled. And um, I think uh, everyone will for sure remember him at Barcelona because of that. And personally, um, the moment of getting drafted was very, very special. Uh, but but I, I think it's tough to say that's the best moment of my professional career because that's basically the moment it started. Uh, probably last year, you know, winning 20 games in a row, um, being holding the longest winning streak in, in North American soccer is pretty special, something that I think is going to be hard to break. Um, and winning the regular season last year was was very special here in, in Phoenix. I had a great season, enjoyed and and um, and I think that that's probably been the highlight of, of my professional career so far. Well, John, we want to thank you so much for taking the time and wish you the best of luck as, again, you're going to continue to get back to training and hopefully the USL Championship can get back to playing soon. And as always, best of luck to Phoenix Rising FC and to yourself, John. And again, thanks so much for the time. Thank you so much, guys. Muchas gracias. Thanks again to John Piquero for joining us on the show. You could tell, Frances, that there's just a different perspective when you get to hear a professional player who grew up under a Camp No legend. And it's something different to be able to hear from a professional player and his perspective on FC Barcelona, just because he really, really understands the big difference in talent between, we'll say, just a regular professional player and what it takes to actually play at Barcelona. And I think that's a big thing, too. Whenever we talk about transfer rumors and throwing tons and tons of names out there about, oh, this player would be good at Barca, you kind of are always reminded by even those who are contemporaries of these professional players that it takes something truly special to play for FC Barcelona. Without a doubt. And I also think that his love for the club and his understanding of what the club stands for is, is second to none. Obviously, having Jose Maria Vaquero as your dad is always going to be an influential benefit, to be honest. And um, as you said, I think that we need to put it into perspective. Not every player is good enough to play for Barca. Um, only the privileged superstars, uh, really talented players, can actually make it. But, you know, as we have been saying for forever in this podcast, for nearly 200 episodes now, Dan, nearly three, well, over three years, nearly 200 episodes, um, defending the Blaurana colors comes with a responsibility and, and the expectations from all is that he's the best he can be. 
Yeah, so again, we want to thank John for joining us on the show. And we want to thank you, the listeners, again, for tuning in. You can tap in your app, check out the show notes to subscribe. You can find us on social media. We're on Twitter at the Barcelona Pod or at Hilton D13 for me and on Instagram at the Barcelona Pod. We also have the links for John Picaro's social media down in the link below as well. Our closed Facebook group is tvpod.link backslash group for deeper dives and discussions. You can help us out on Patreon, where we do the quick take match reviews at tbpod.link backslash Patreon. That is where I break down all the tactics, really giving a fine-tooth comb look at these matches. We're also on YouTube, as we have been at the Barcelona Podcast. And at least until the season ends, I've been pushing out those match reviews where we, again, want to just try to bring in more listeners to this pod. And we do that with the match reviews over on YouTube. So check us out there. Hit that subscription button. And as always, thanks again for listening to the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Before the Barca. Barca. Well